So good morning, welcome to numerical methods. So we are in a section on numerical approximation of partial derivatives. And we saw three very simple methods of approximating partial derivatives. So we are looking at dv by dx at say some point x. And from Taylor expansion, you can very quickly derive the finite difference approximation and also estimate uh, the approximation error. <clears throat> so we distinguished here the three different approximations, forward finite difference, yeah, go to the x plus h, backward finite difference, go to the x minus h, and central or centered finite difference, yeah, just take the both points at x minus h and x, x plus h. Okay, so the first two are order h approximation, error approximations, and the third one is order h squared. So maybe it's better to use that guy. And then we made a small numerical experiment. So we were testing this uh, for the exponential function yeah, at x equals zero. So derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function at x equals zero is just one. And we were plotting the error, the approximation error. So we are we are plotting the function the shift size maps to well the finite difference approximation x plus h minus exponential at x, which is just one, divided by h. So that was the finite difference approximation minus the analytic value. So the analytic value is the one and the finite difference approximation is that part here. And we were plotting this function and that function looked like that. <clears throat> So we saw that for very small values, we suddenly get very high approximation errors while Taylor expansion or our approximation formula suggests we should use very small values. And we could also you know, investigate this function and understand why this function is looking like that. Okay, it comes from the fact that exponential of x, the result of this valuation is rounded to the nearest floating point number. And looking a little bit closer to this, we saw that this error function is actually mapping the shift size h to h times two to the power of p. So that's for small h, the resolution we see, yeah, rounded to the nearest integer, divided by h to the times two to the power of p minus one. So when the guy on the top here is an integer, then I have h times two to the power of p divided by h times two to the power of p. So one minus one, I have zero. I have zero approximation error if that is an integer. So in other words, we need to check if h has the representation c divided by two to the power of p where c is an integer. Because then the result is one plus this and the result is exactly a floating point number. So we could check here these uh, different values. So this guy here should then have no discretization errors, no approximation error. And here these fractional parts should have an approximation error. These were then here in the plot, the points where we have no approximation error and the points where we have approximation errors, yeah, where we maybe jump to the next rounding. And we created this plot yeah, on our own yeah, numerically in this small experiment. Uh, 
Maybe I have moved that one. So this was more or less the point where we where we ended. And maybe we can just uh, verify that our observation is correct. So here, this little function is plotting the approximation and approximation error for different shift size. Okay, and if I run that program, okay, maybe I disable here creation of the plot so that not always we get this window. So we saw that for large shift sizes, we get some errors. For small shift sizes, yeah, we also get some errors. And yeah, for even smaller one, we get very large error. So let's just verify our observation that if the shift size is of the special form that we have a two to the power of minus 52. So that's our C equals one divided by two to the power of 52. 52 is the P for the double precision floating point number that we get no approximation error in that case. And you see, we get no approximation error in that case. Finite difference is equal to one. The shift size is very small. Yeah, So you find one that is smaller than that guys yeah? and has no discretization error. And let's move to the point one half yeah, divided by this. So let's move a little bit to the left. Okay, I have approximation error minus one. Let's move a little bit to the right. Uh, so you can you can choose a 50 or 51. Uh, a 50 is still uh, a minus one. Let's use a 51. I have almost a plus one. Yeah? So let's choose something like that. Okay, so it jumps from minus one to plus one, which is in our little picture, exactly this jump here. Error is minus one, then I jump to plus one. Huh? So that's the location here, C equals one half. Okay, so this guy should be maybe C equals 1.5, yeah? and then this guy is C equals two. So this jump here, is at the location 1.5. Maybe I'd also check that guy. 1.5, oh, let's try that guy. Okay, and you see one over three, one third, yeah, is now the approximation error, which is exactly this point here. So we have a very good understanding of this picture. Let's plot the picture again. So now our code is plotting this picture and we were running here with the scale from minus 16, yeah, so minus 16.5 minus 16.5 to minus 14. So that is, we are looking for very small shifts from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 14. So now let's take a broader range. Yeah? Let's go maybe to the guys which we had here in the beginning uh, at 10 to the minus two, something like that, or at 10 to the minus one. So let's move to a minus one here and plot so maybe I do that with a separate plot. Plot this for a much broader range. Okay, so that's now the picture. So this is the region where we have this zigzag curve. And if the shift size is becoming larger yeah, to that side, maybe I can also go to the zero. Yeah, so the shift is then just the one. Okay, then you see that the error from Taylor expansion is suddenly kicking in. Okay, so where is the optimal shift size? What is a good choice for the shift? So can we get an intuition for this? What is influencing 
the right choice for the shifts. So that's my next section. Let's start looking at error estimate for the first order finite difference. So the problem is now well understood. Our lemma suggests to choose age as small as possible. However, we have from the floating point arithmetic that if, well, V is continuous, yeah, so smaller uh, shift size yeah, makes also the values becoming closer. Then if the values are becoming closer, they can drop underneath the point where the computer can distinguish the values as being two different values. So this means rounding V of X plus H and rounding V of X will result in the same number. So it means that the difference of the two is zero and I just get a zero divided by um, H. Yeah? So my derivative is always zero. My derivative as approximation is always zero. So that was the point where the graph jumped down to the minus one. And for the values where he can distinguish it, the rounding error is so large yeah, that uh, we get oscillating, oscillating error. So we have this uh, problem, uh, but note here, it's not that X plus H is close to X, where the difference between X and X plus H is below machine precision. Yeah? That, that's not the point. The point is that the values are becoming close to each other. So um, I do not have this problem here with H smaller than machine precision. There is a constant here. And the constant depends on, well, the derivative um, um, of, of the function, yeah, of the function V. So it's not yet clear, yeah, what is, um, a good uh, shift set. It depends on, on the function. So I will now work from the thing I like to approximate, which is the partial derivative of V, step by step to our approximation. So the first step is the finite difference from Taylor expansion, but in the mathematical sense. So without considering computer arithmetics. So we have from Taylor expansion that we can approximate the partial derivative by our finite difference V of X plus H minus V of X divided by H. And the Taylor expansion also tells us that this error is bounded by a constant. Let's call this constant now C2 times H divided by two, where the constant C2 is a bound to the second derivative. Yeah? So if the second derivative is bounded here on our little interval, on some, some interval, then if H is from that interval, uh, we have this error bound. So that's the first step, partial derivative to finite difference approximation in the mathematical sense. This is the step that tells me choose H as small as possible. So the next step is that these quantities are implemented in the computer using computer arithmetic. So the next step is that I have to go from my mathematical expression for the finite difference to the expression where V is now calculated in the computer. So I assume that the computer implementation is here denoted by V tilde. So I have a difference between the computer implementation of my exponential function in this example. So the computer implementation of V and the true exponential function. Assume that this 
implementation has some error bound. So I assume that I have an error bound, which is alpha. <clears throat> so um, I'm not taking here the assumption that I can calculate the function V tilde up to machine precision. For our exponential function, actually this is the case because the exponential function is implemented on the level of the IEEE 754 standard. Yeah? Actually, it's even sometimes implemented in hardware. So processors have this function and it's guaranteed that the rounding error of the result is below machine precision. So actually for the exponential function, we would have this guarantee for the result yeah, that the result Z the floating point number deviates from the true solution set by less than epsilon, epsilon time, time set. Yeah? So the relative error is bounded by the machine precision. Here, I don't make this assumption. So um, I use here a general bound um, alpha because later we will also um, encounter situations where the bound is much larger. For example, for a Monte Carlo, approximation of evaluation, you have the Monte Carlo error and you have a huge bound alpha. Yeah? So that will be our Monte Carlo error, error bound. Okay. Um, nevertheless, in, in my calculation in the end, I will just assume that the alpha is maybe just the um, epsilon times um, the size of the value V. So uh, later I will assume that uh, alpha is around um, epsilon times C0, where C0 is bound to the value V. That is actually the best we can um, expect. Yeah? So if you think of um, V tilde is implemented in the best possible way, yeah? so the rounding error is just the machine precision, then the best we can accept, sorry, then the best we can expect is actually to have this result that the relative error, the relative rounding error is the epsilon. So the best we can accept, um, expect is that the alpha is equal to epsilon times C0. So the best approximation we can reasonably assume here for the alpha is Alpha is machine precision times C0. Okay, why C0? Because it is a relative error. Yeah? So this is epsilon times Z. And the Z is, in this case, I'm looking at the rounding error of the values of the function results. The Z is the value of V. Yeah? So you could say here the value of, of the V. So, sorry. Yeah, the, uh, uh, right. The Z is the value of the V. So that means I have here this guy with a bound C0 on the value um, of C. I assuming this for the evaluation at X and the evaluation at X plus zero. So I'm assuming that for both guys here. Uh, so both guys, both function evaluation produce at most uh, an error alpha. And um, then I have that the difference of the true finite difference. And now my finite difference involving the computer implementation, involving the computer implementation of the evaluation function V is less than, okay, I have the V twice here inside two times alpha, but then I'm dividing by H. So two times alpha times uh, divided by H. So the error between now the mathematical finite difference and the finite difference using the computer implementation of my function V is less than two alpha divided by H. Then we are calculating in the next, next step this final difference. So we are taking here this value minus that value and divide by H. So these are also operations that are implemented in the computer. And they are also yeah, maybe um, associated with rounding errors. But here I know that 
subtraction and division uh, just has uh, a rounding error associated with the machine precision yeah, because they are guaranteed to be exact up to machine precision. So for these two operations here, so that guy and here the division, I can now assume uh, a similar estimate, but with, with an epsilon. So that's now the third step. So the third step is that I go from the finite difference using the function evaluations performed in the computer to the finite difference calculated in the computer. So the rounding of this operation here to a floating point number. Okay, so if I perform this operation here, yeah, I will have an error that is uh, proportional to the value of the guys. So the value of the guys, it can be bounded again by my C0. So C0 is a bound to the value. times machine precision. Okay, and um, a two times here yeah, because I have uh, also the um, uh, d division by H. So I have that this difference is now less than two times epsilon C0 divided by H. Okay, so these two guys are here because the subtraction has an additional rounding error. And then with the division, we have epsilon times C0 divided by H. So now I can combine the step two and the step three. So I have that the difference of my finite difference evaluated in the computer. So that is my final approximation and my finite difference, the true finite difference is less than or is bounded by two times alpha plus epsilon C0 times H. Note alpha was the approximation error we get here if we evaluate the function. If the best we can get there um, is the epsilon times C0. So remember here alpha, the best we can expect for alpha is epsilon C0. So if you look at the best case, you will have here again also an epsilon times C0. So you see this is just a four times epsilon C0 divided by H. So the finite difference approximation has an error that is epsilon times the magnitude of the function. Okay, that's reasonable, yeah? so four times because there are many steps involved, but it's also here related to the magnitude of the function, uh, four times epsilon times the magnitude of the function, but then divided by H because we are dividing by H. So this error is magnified if H becomes small. So the rounding error in these calculations is magnified if H becomes small. Yeah, you clearly see that here. So now we have step one to step two. Uh, so now, uh, so, sorry. So now in addition, we also have step one which was moving from the partial derivative to the finite difference. So we now combine step one and two and three. So I combine this guy with that guy and we get that the approximation error we have for the true partial derivative 
using a computer implementation of a finite difference is okay so one part was here the part coming from the computer arithmetic and the other part was coming from the Taylor expansion So my error bound I see here is two times alpha plus epsilon C zero for the best case, four times epsilon C zero divided by H. So H should be chosen large plus one half C two times H. So H should be chosen small. C zero is a bound on the value. Uh, C2 is a bound on the second derivative. Yeah? So that's also the reason why I named them C0 and C2. So a bound to the first derivative would be named C1 and to the third C3 and so on, which will pop up maybe later. Okay, so now this is a bound. Yeah? Of course, in between, there can be points that are much better as you see on our zigzag curve. Yeah? So this here is maybe just the hull yeah, the envelope of our zigzag curve. So our error bound, yeah, maybe it's not good, but our error bound is maybe something like the hull of our zigzag curve. Yeah, so bounding this, okay. And um, now I would like to find the optimal shift size in the sense that I lo I'm looking for the minimum of this bound because I cannot be sure just to, to hit here one of these points by, by coincidence. Okay, so just view the right-hand side is a function of um, H. So I have the function, the shift size maps to two times alpha plus epsilon C zero divided by H plus one half C two times H. So differentiating this well gives me here a divided by H squared with a minus in front and this guy is vanishing. So if I differentiate this, I have minus two times alpha plus epsilon C zero divided by H squared plus one half C two that should be equal to zero. So I divide by the one half C2, which gives me a four divided by C2. Okay, and um, I just uh, multiply uh, with, with the H, uh, so and move that to the other side. So I get H squared is four times alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by C2. Taking the square root, we have the optimal solution. So the optimal shift size should be two times the square root of alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by C2. If we now uh, go back, uh, yeah, and remind ourselves that the best we can expect for alpha is an epsilon C0. And that would be the best case when the function implementation is um, exact up to machine position, which is the case for our exponential function. Then here we would have square root of two times epsilon C0 divided by C2. So in the case where I choose here, or I can say that alpha is, yeah, maybe good approximation epsilon C0. We get for the optimal shift size, a square root of eight times C0 divided by C2 times epsilon. The constant C0 was an upper bound to the value. The constant C2 
was an upper bound to the second derivative. So now for our exponential function, the derivative is the exponential function. The second derivative is the exponential function. Actually, the two bounds C0 are the same. So if we are in the special case where C0, so that's just the special case, where C0 is approximately equal to C2, you see that we have here square root of eight times epsilon. So our, our epsilon in, in floating point double numbers, so for double precision floating point numbers, our epsilon is a 10 to the minus 16. So taking the square root is a 10 to the minus eight. So I have something like square root of eight times 10 to the minus eight. So this suggests that the optimal shift size for our exponential function should be something like a 10 to the minus eight. Maybe we should have a look at this. Is this, is this really working? Okay, so uh, I have here the plot from minus 16. Let's now look in the region, say from 10, from minus 10 to minus six. Yeah, So the 10 to the minus eight is in between this region. Okay, so that's here the region from a shift size 10 to the minus 10 to a 10 to the minus six. And you already see that the approximation error here is really becoming small. Huh? So my approximation error is already in the region of a 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus uh, six. But on the left-hand side, you still see that you have really strange oscillations coming from the machine precision thing. And on the right-hand side, you see that Taylor expansion error is kicking in. And yeah, really, it's something like a 10 to the minus eight where yeah, it's a little bit larger. It's a square root of eight times 10 to the minus eight. Yeah, so maybe it's somewhere here where the optimal shift size is. Okay, that's a nice thing. And you have an intuition for the optimal shift size. If you know a little bit the behavior of the function and the behavior of the second derivative. Okay. Let's try the same for the central finite difference. Yeah. So is it is it the same value? How does it work? So if I now consider the same for the central finite difference. Okay, it's actually the same steps. So we can move a little bit quicker through this. I have the first step where I move from the partial derivative to the finite difference approximation, which now reads V of X plus H minus V of X minus H divided by two H, which gives me from Taylor expansion, a bound on the third derivative so C3 is now a bound on the third derivative multiplied by H squared. So we have one order more divided by six. Yeah, so the one times two times three, the three faculty. Then the other steps are really the same. Yeah? Just that now my argument V uh, of V, uh, the X is replaced by the X minus H. So the next step is again the same that I have an error if I move from the mathematical function to the computer implementation of the function, this guy. And then the immediately the third step, if I calculate the finite difference approximation in the computer. So I get here really the same bound, which was a two times alpha plus epsilon z zero divided by two H. So that's just the same error we have from computer arithmetic.
And a new bound from Taylor Expansion, which is now a bit better. Uh, what, what, one second, I'm disturbed here. Uh, one second. Man, man, man. Uh, one second. I'm sorry, I'm back. So where was I? Ah, yeah, okay. Okay, so that's what we have for our approximation error between the partial derivative and our computer implementation of the central finite difference. So now same game, I like to minimize my error bound as a function of h. So I'm differentiating this. If you now differentiate this, you get a minus one divided by h squared uh, here huh, with actually the same uh, coefficient. And here you get a two times h. So I get a C3 times h divided by three. So the, oops. a minus alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by h squared and oops, wrong color. And minus alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by h squared and a plus one divided by three C3 um, h. I like to minimize it, set it equal to zero. Okay. So move one guy to the other side. Yeah. Multiply with h squared gives you an h to the power of three divide by C3 multiplied with three, I get a three times alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by C3 is equal in H to the power of three. Take the third root. Yeah, so my optimal solution is the third root of three times alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by C3. Again, if we take the best possible case for alpha, the implementation of our function, um, I get here something that is a six times C0 divided by C3 times epsilon to the power of one divided by three. So here, the C zero is again a bound to the value. And now the C three is a bound to the third derivative. Okay, that's why I call it C three. And um, if the, the guys are of the same order of magnitude, 
which is the case for our exponential function. So the derivative of the exponential is the ex exponential. So if I can assume here that these are the same, okay, then you just have a six times epsilon to the power of one over three. Epsilon is a 10 to the minus fix, uh, f uh, 16. Yeah? So the third root of this is approximately a 10 to the minus five. So I would expect that if I choose the central finite difference, the optimal shift size for my exponential function um, experiment is a 10 to the minus five. So it means compared to the 10 to the minus eight, I can choose a somewhat larger shift size because the Taylor expansion error is not so strong. So I can choose a larger shift size to reduce the numerical approximation, the computer arithmetic induced um, error. Let's maybe explore also this in our uh, computer experiment. Okay, so now I just duplicate here the code. Yeah, So that here was the code that just to us this printing. This here is the code that does this plotting. Uh, so let me just completely duplicate this code here. Uh, code duplication is not nice, but that's just for demo here. And let's call this plot central uh, or centered finite difference approximation error. So I have a new function and let's calculate here the finite difference now with the central finite difference. So I have the shift size is a function of my scale parameter. Then I calculate the value upshift. So I also need now the value downshift, which is exponential X minus H. So I do not need that guy here. Uh, and I have my finite difference is now value upshift minus value downshift divided by two times shift size. Yeah? So there's another uh, division by two. That should be my central finite difference. So maybe this here is now centered or central finite difference. Okay, so that's now a new function here. So maybe we can also create the plot with the sky. Okay, so what's a good region? So I expect the error to be in the region of a 10 to the minus five. Well, so maybe I go from minus six uh, or seven to a 10 to the minus four here for this uh, central finite difference. And maybe you can also plot the other guy for the central. Okay, so maybe you can remove that guy. Okay, so that here was our starting point yeah, where we started to observe for very small shift size, we get these oscillations. And you see that for the central finite difference, the oscillations are already a little bit different yeah, because uh, the two values now suddenly jump um, at different at different points. Yeah, there is the X minus H and the X plus H that suddenly make a few changes, but you have also uh, this uh, problem. Okay, that was the picture where we were searching for the optimal shift size for the forward finite difference, the one-sided one, and it was a 10 to the minus eight. Yeah. And you see here in this region, which is going from the minus 10 to the minus six, I already go up here to a 10 to the minus six. Here the, for the central finite difference, the error is already very small. Yeah? It's already a 10 to the minus nine. And you see that the optimal shift size is maybe, yeah, really in a 10 to the minus five, maybe a bit larger here, 10 to the minus 5.5. Okay, it was a third root of a 10 to the minus 16. Yeah, so it is, um, yeah, 
maybe a minus 5.3 or something like that. It's maybe here. Yeah, cool. So we can verify this, that these guys here give us really uh, helpful hints. What are the optimal shift sizes to calculate the finite difference? So to summarize the result, uh, we have some bounds on the function value or, and also on the derivative. The second derivative bound is C2, third derivative bound is C3. I also have a bound on the function implementation error that is here my alpha. So I have this bound alpha here, which is a bound on my function implementation error. And then we have for the one-sided finite difference, the two alpha plus epsilon C0 divided by H plus one half C2H and for the central finite difference, the same expression for the computer arithmetic error and a one divided by six C3 times H squared as um, approximation errors for our finite difference approximation compared to the true partial derivative. Okay, so maybe, um, yeah, a few remarks. Yeah, maybe I already made these remarks. Okay, this is just an indication. Yeah, I mean, we are differentiating a bound. Okay, so this can be just an indication. Um, also, you see that, for example, if the second derivative, so for example, the C2 yeah, is zero or very small, it means that you have um, a linear function. Yeah, so where C2 is uh, zero, you have a linear function. Then you can choose the shift as large as possible. Yeah? Uh, because for a linear function, the derivative uh, does not have an error, even if you use uh, large uh, shifts. As long as the shift is not so large that you get numerical errors because it is too large. There is a nice um, interpretation on the constants. And um, that's also a remark I sometimes like to make. Uh, you should use, if you see formulas, uh, also here in mathematical finance or in numerical methods, uh, you should maybe sometimes move to the units and check the units of these guys to get, well, to verify that the formula makes sense yeah, or, a, or also to improve your intuition. So what do I mean with units? I mean, I mean physical units like meter per second times kilogram, whatever. Yeah? When you have um, a law in physics, you can check if it is correct by checking that the units are canceling in the right way. And the funny thing is that even in this strange estimate here, there is, a nice relation between the units. So just recall our formulas. So for the central, it was six C zero divided by C three epsilon to the power of one divided by three. For the one-sided, it was eight C zero divided by C two times epsilon to the power of one half. Let me copy this here.
Okay, so what is C0? C0 is a bound to the value. So what is the unit of C0? So C0 has the unit of the function V. So if the function V is a length, yeah, then function V measures in meters. So C0 is a bound to this. C0 is also in meters. So what is C2? Well, C2 is a bound to the second derivative. So a derivative is something V per something X. That is the first derivative. The second derivative is something V per X squared. Yeah? So how does V changes if X squared changes. You also see this in the finite difference. Yeah? In the finite difference for the second derivative, we divide by H squared. So this guy here has the unit of V divided by the unit of X squared. Yeah? So if V is something measured in meters yeah, and X is a time, yeah, so then the first derivative is meter per second is a velocity. The second derivative is meter per second squared is an acceleration. So what is then the unit that you have inside here? Okay, so the unit that you have inside there is the unit of C0 divided by C2, which is a one divided by unit of X squared. Uh, so a one, uh, no, which is a unit of V divided by unit of V divided by unit of X squared. So that's just the unit of X squared. So this constant that is here, if V is a meter and X is a second, is a second squared. Okay, and then you take a square root. You take a square root. And epsilon does not have a unit. So if you take the square root, then the unit of this is the unit of x. So it is in the unit of x's. And it is in square root of epsilon times the unit of x's. So epsilon tells you the relative movement you should do in x. Well, that's exactly what the h is. The h is the relative movement you should do on the arguments to reduce the error in the values. And this object has exactly the right unit. Of course, you can also do the same for the C3. Yeah? So the C3 is bound to the third derivative. So the C3 has the unit value divided by arguments to the power of three. Okay, so this guy here has the unit arguments to the power of three. We are taking a third root. So this means that this whole expression, whoops. So that means this whole expression has the unit. Epsilon is a unitless quantity. It's a relative, relative movement, uh, relative machine precision error. So it's unitless. This has just the unit also X. Yeah? So it is that if you use central finite difference, you should third root of epsilon relative movement on the X arguments. So that's uh, maybe a nice, nice thing here to, to see that um, these uh, formulas, yeah, C0 divided by C3 to the power of uh, one divided by three, yeah, they really 
really have, they really make sense. Yeah, It's the relative movement on the arguments you should apply to reduce the relative error on the valuations. And of course, you can immediately guess if you have a higher order, uh, an order three approximation, you will get something like C zero divided by C four to the power of one divided by four and so on. Yeah. Okay, so that's about units, which uh, yeah, some some observation which I really like, which is also helpful in other aspects of mathematical finance. Interest rates, yeah, an interest rate is something where you have something per time, and then uh, if you multiply with uh, a time frame, yeah, you have the change. Yeah, that's that's really really nice nice things yeah, to check the units. So then. Summary, our numerical experiment. Okay, we already did this. Plot the finite difference approximation, forward finite difference. That was done. Central finite difference, that was done. Okay, you find the code here. Yeah, maybe you like to play with this a little bit. This is just in the script the picture, yeah? so the larger range here from minus 20, I believe to maybe some something like zero. Uh, and then the magnification yeah, that we get here, the optimal shift size approximately at a 10 to the minus eight, and here approximately at a 10 to the minus five or 5.5. .5. And again, the other plots. Yeah, let's very quickly show you that we can also approximate higher order derivatives. Yeah? So you can also make the discussion which we made for higher order derivatives. For example, the second order derivative. So the scheme is always the same. So now for a second order derivative, we take a look at our Taylor expansion. So I write down the Taylor expansion now for many different uh, shifts. So let's take here, for example, two different shifts. So this here is for the shift H. This here is for the shift minus H. I use the expansion now for N equals uh, three. So if you go to the Taylor expansion, now my N is equal to three. So my remainder term is N plus one is a power of four divided by four faculty. So force derivative times an H to the power of four divided by 24 at some intermediate point. So then you can create these uh, equations say up to different ends for different points. And the idea is that you just solve these equations for the quantity of interest. In our case, the second derivative by trying to cancel out uh, the other terms. So here it is um, easy that I can cancel out the odd orders. So h to the power of, oops, so h to the power of one and h to the power of three by just adding the two equations. Yeah, the odd orders will uh, cancel. So adding the two equations, the odd order will cancel. So this guy goes away with that one. This guy goes away with that one such that I just have the thing of interest plus my remainder. And on the left-hand side, I just have the function evaluations, which then uh, constitute my approximation. So on the left-hand side, I add the two, I have V plus H. So I have V of X plus H, which comes here plus V of X, which I actually get now twice with a minus in front because I just add them. And I have a minus V of, uh, sorry, I have a plus V of X minus H because I have add them on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, 
the derivative I would like to approximate plus the sum of the two remainders. Again, with the mean value theorem, you can find a single valuation of the fourth derivative in between, so some C, and dividing by dividing by h squared, So h squared goes away here yeah, and comes here. I get now my finite difference approximation. For the second order, second derivative, which you maybe know, yeah, v of x plus h minus two times the center point plus v of x minus h divided by h squared. Of course, you can now do the same game as before. No? Actually, it's not a very big deal. No? So I have not three functions, Yeah, maybe a little bit the constant in front increase. And you have here this h squared in the finite difference that will make a change. Yeah, But you also have an uh, h squared here in the remainder term that will make a change. But you can now just derive in a similar way an uh, error estimate that includes the uh, uh, thing that you have approximation errors coming from the computer implementation. Yeah, that was my little section on approximation of partial derivatives.